It's my great pleasure to be here, and it's my honor to represent uh, Division 6. What I'm going to do in the next few minutes is to give you some idea of my career path and how I engineer the real metabolic pathways. I was uh, uh, growing up in Taiwan and trained as a chemical engineer. After a few years of uh, education, um, I got tired of making chemicals uh, using petroleum. So uh, uh, my PhD advisor at Lightfoot, who was also a member of this academy who celebrated his uh, 90th birthday uh, two weeks ago, well, um, we decided to uh, analyze metabolism or human systems using chemical engineering principles. We treat these uh, metabolic systems as a sophisticated uh, chemical plant. More recently, uh, we're trying to shrink the whole chemical plant into a single microorganisms. And we further wanted to re really design a chemical plant. Hopefully, that will be successful. So all these were made possible by Louis Pasteur, who first discovered that microorganisms could conduct chemical reactions. After the next few decades, the pathways, the chemical reactions for all the uh, our uh, um, fundamental reactions happening in cells were discovered by many, many people, including uh, what I've shown here, um, uh, Emden Melhoff, uh, who discovered the glycolysis, and TCA cycle, urea cycle, uh, di discovered by Hans Krebs. And then uh, Kelvin discovered the carbon dioxide fixation pathway. So at that time, most people, most scientists thought that uh, the secret of life was solved, at least the chemical secret of life was solved. The rest are just details. <laughs> Around that time, 1950s to 1960s, there was a great time of molecular biology, so all the attention turned to molecular biology, particularly in regulation. So we thought that, uh, we mean the field thought that uh, this metabolism was all understood, now we turn our attention to regulation. So in my early career, I was also working on regulation. I was working on nitrogen starvation regulation and trying to, to find out how it interacts with carbon uh, metabolism. Unfortunately, my work was scooped, so to speak, and people found that uh, the way it was interacting with the carbon metabolism was because this key uh, sensor, NTRC, instead of uh, being phosphorylated by the corresponding, um, uh, uh, this is the regulator, uh, uh, instead of being phosphorylated by its corresponding sensor, NTRB, it was actually possible to be phosphorylated by a metabolite called acetylphosphate. So we were scooped, but then we turned this into an engineering the application. We thought we could delete the corresponding uh, sensor, and then turn this regulator to respond to a metabolite exclusively. So this concept was implemented in an engineering system so that we can control a production of a chemical. And this turned out to be very successful. We made a lycopene, which was the color responsible for the tomato the color. We turned, into, turned E. coli the fermentation into a tomato paste. And we further engineered the more sophisticated uh, control loops in several different phases interacting with each other so we can uh, develop a sustained oscillation of GFP. That was great, we were happy, and unfortunately, around that time, the third or maybe fourth times of, of uh, energy crisis was happening and people began to worry about energy and climate change. And if you live in Los Angeles, you realize that uh, if you want to solve the uh, traffic problem by building more traffic light, it's not going to do it. You have to build more highways. So learning about all these uh, regulations was great, but at that time, we thought we would need to build more highways. So let's look at the climate change problem. The reason why we had climate change was that we produce too much of uh, high, uh, carbon dioxide. If we continue business as usual, in a few decades, 
the carbon dioxide concentration in the, in the atmosphere will be exceeding 600 ppm, and that will correspond to a temperature rise of about three degrees Celsius. And that leads to a, a series of disastrous events. And even if these events are uh, happening gradually, uh, we cannot take the risk. So we first look at the uh, carbon balance. The global carbon balance before the Industrial Revolution was carefully balanced by land and ocean carbon dioxide absorption, uh, photosynthesis, respiration, and decomposition. After uh, Industrial Revolution, we began to burn fossil fuels, and that increased the carbon dioxide flux to the atmosphere by about 6.3 gigatons a year. And this, is, uh, num this number probably continued to increase. So one solution is instead of burning fossil fuel, we should use renewable electricity, and that may decrease the fossil fuel uh, release of carbon dioxide. This is a great solution, except that it has a problem. That is, there's very little way to store the electricity. The best way today is using battery. But battery has a very low energy density compared to liquid fuel that we are used to. Okay? It's about 50 times lower than the liquid fuel that we're used to. No matter what kind of liquid fuel you're, use, you're using, it always has a much higher uh, energy density. Because of that, at least before this problem is solved, we will still have to rely on liquid fuel for some time. So in order to, to make liquid fuel, it's probably the best way to utilize biology in a way such that we can directly take CO2 from the atmosphere, or indirectly, and then convert that to some kind of liquid fuel and burn it. So this process is possible using biology, but it's going to be very difficult using completely chemistry, because biology today is still the best way to fix carbon dioxide. So over the past uh, few years, my lab and many others in the field has first worked on how to direct metabolism to make various kind of fuel products. Okay, in order to do that, we have to first identify the genes, the proteins, the pathways, the promoters, and so on and so forth, and make sure that the pathway that we establish doesn't negatively affect the cell too much, and we can produce these kind of compounds very effectively. So far, this kind of problem has been demonstrated uh, uh, many times, and the remaining problem is optimizing these pathways. So we turn our attention to what kind of carbon feedstock we can use. Traditionally, people first demonstrate the pathway using sugar. And then we now turn to um, find is there a better carbon feedstock. Eventually, we want to use CO2. <clears throat> so there are quite a few microorganisms that can conduct photosynthesis, and cyanobacteria is one of them. And it's one of the simplest uh, photosynthetic organisms. So again, our group and many others have demonstrated that, yes, indeed, one can directly convert CO2 to whatever compound you like if you judiciously engineer the, the metabolism. And so you can conduct direct conversion of CO2 to fuel using sunlight. And the productivity actually is quite reasonable uh, compared to the sugar-based biofuel. However, this kind of technology is going to be very difficult to commercialize. It still needs a lot of work because you need expensive photobioreactors, and there are many associated problems that still being worked on. So instead of using this, we explore other possibilities. That is, can we combine photovoltaic systems with biological photosynthesis. We know that photosynthesis, biological photosynthesis, converts sunlight to make biomass. The best yield is about 4 to 6 percent, depending on whether you use C4 or C6 or C, C3 plants. However, if you use photovoltaic cells, the 
uh, practical efficiency is easily 10 to 20 percent. Okay. However, it stops at charge separation. It doesn't make biomass. So if we can somehow combine the efficiency of photovoltaic system with some biological processes, maybe we can do better. And one way to do that is to replace partially the photosystems, which convert sunlight to ATP and usable electrons, called NADPH. We replace this kind of photosystems with photovoltaic uh, cells, which generate electricity, and then we use that electricity to reduce carbon dioxide to formic acid. And then formic acid can be used to donate electrons to power Kelvin cycle to fix CO2. And then we steal the intermediate from Kelvin cycle to make fuels. So we can put all these things together. We can combine chemistry, electrochemistry, biology, genetic engineering, and then we can directly convert CO2 to fuel with the help of electricity. And then we can separate the dark reactions with the light reactions. And this light reactions you can do in any way you like. So we demonstrated this idea using an organism called Rastonia. We engineered this Rastonia to produce isobutanol. And then we integrate that with the electrochemical systems that convert CO2 to formic acid. And then we can use the uh, uh, electricity either directly generated from sunlight or any um, electricity source. So this become a, an alternative way and possibly very uh, usable way to store electricity. We convert electricity to a chemical that is very stable that you can use for a long time and has a much higher energy density than batteries. So, so far we talk about many applications of biological systems. But regardless of what you do, you have to rely on the type of chemical pathways that I alluded to in the beginning. Namely, we first convert sunlight to usable energies using um, photosystems, photo and then use ATP and electrons to drive Kelvin cycle to make glucose. Okay. And some of the glucose is stored as cellulose. And then we use glucose to make whatever we want, including biomass, including various chemicals and fuels. Now in this process, inevitably, you have to go through two intermediates. One is called pyruvate, which has three carbon. The other one is acetyl-CoA, which has two carbon. So it takes so much effort to fix carbon only to lose one third of them in this kind of process. So the maximum theoretical carbon yield of almost all the biological processes is a 66%. And this is a glass ceiling of biological conversion. As a result, if you try to make ethanol from glucose, you will need two kilos of glucose to make one kilo of ethanol. And ethanol price is about 80 cents per kilo, whereas sugar price is about 40 cents per kilo. And you need two kilos to make one, two kilos of sugar to make one kilo of ethanol. This is where you appreciate government. So the reason for this low yield is because you lose carbon in the process called glycolysis. You lose one third of carbon there. So how do you deal with this problem? Theoretically, you can convert one glucose and split three ways to make three molecules of acetate. And acetate has the same redox potential as acetyl-CoA. So you can then convert this compound to almost everything you like. Now, nature developed this kind of uh, uh, pathways by first evolving CO2 and then assimilate CO2 using a very complicated process called Wood-Lindo pathway. And that is very difficult to deal with. So our lab has worked on another approach which rely on an enzyme called phosphoketolase, which was uh, discovered almost 50 years ago. And this enzyme can split a six carbon phosphate to two and four, or 
of 5 carbon phosphate to 2 and 3. The question is, once you get 2 carbon, how do you deal with the remaining 4 carbon or 3 carbon? So we develop a way to rearrange this carbon in a redox balanced way without using any energy or electrons. We develop a set of pathways that convert, for example, four carbon, three moles of four carbon to two moles of six carbon. And then we can balance the whole thing. And therefore, we can achieve a complete carbon conservation from six carbon to three moles of two carbon. The details of this is shown here. We utilize the enzymes that are commonly available in almost all organisms that are, that are involved in pentose phosphate pathway and the photosynthesis and various kind of uh, systems. You can see that we can import four carbons uh, phosphate into this system and then produce six uh, carbon phosphate. And we can trace the carbon completely to demonstrate this is exactly what we think is happening. Another way to, to visualize this kind of pathway is shown here. You can see it uh, cycles within the cycles. And probably this is the reason that they escape uh, uh, many people's uh, um, uh, uh, investigation. And people suspected this kind of uh, pathway existed in nature, but wasn't able to find it before. So now using this pathway, we're able to convert one more of glucose to three more of uh, ethanol. Instead of using 1.5 previously, using traditional fermentation, we need to use 1.5 moles of glucose to make three more of ethanol. However, we will need to put in additional electron, which is hydrogen. So the question becomes, which one is cheaper? If you are only interested in, in, in money, if you are not worried about CO2, then you compare the electron. So if six moles of sugar is cheaper than half mole of glucose, then this pathway non-oxidative glycolysis makes sense. And that corresponds to about uh, $3 per kilo sorry, of, of um, hydrogen. And this process, if you think of this way, it is a hydrogen-assisted CO2 fixation, which is very difficult to accomplish using chemical pathways. Now, you ask the question, where do we get hydrogen? Of course, ideally, you should get hydrogen from renewable resources, but that is still currently difficult, expensive at least. The current way to generate hydrogen most economically is through methane. Okay, methane steam reforming, which can generate more hydrogen than it contains in methane. Okay, that's where you gain a little bit of edge. So if you use methane as a hydrogen source, you'll find that you can com still convert uh, one mole of sugar to three moles of ethanol, but you generate 1.5 mole of CO2, which is still much better than the traditional fermentation okay, in terms of CO2 uh, evolution. So using this, the pathway you can think of as uh, methane upgrading. We know that we have lots of methane in the United States. Using this type of uh, approach, you'll be able to add half of the CO2 to 1.5 moles of methane to make ethanol. Again, this type of reactions is not possible using straight chemistry. But then we couple <laughs> chemical reactions with fermentation and make this thermodynamically challenging process feasible. Speaking of methane, one of the important um, uh, co um, intermediates come out of methane is methanol. And we like to utilize methanol to uh, convert methanol to ethanol okay, so that we can utilize the, the fuel better. Again, this type of reactions is thermodynamically feasible but chemically very difficult. The reaction come closest is Gerber reaction, which coupled C1 and C3, and it's very difficult to couple two C C1s together. So using the similar kind of principles, we develop a series of methanol condensation cycle, 
that were able to condense two moles of methanol to one mole of C2, and then we can make that into ethanol or butanol. Okay. Now, let's turn our attention to an opposite carbon problem. Okay. We have too much uh, energy in our body, and this obesity turns out to be a major source of many diseases. And there are many cure, many uh, uh, proposed solutions for this obesity problem, but primarily they're focusing on regulation. And like I said, just building traffic lights are not going to solve the traffic problems. We need more highways. So in order to build more highways, we actually created an alternative CO2 burning pathway in mitochondria. And that cut through the TCA cycle. Now, when we install this pathway into mice, okay, we pleasantly surprised that the mice that contain our novel pathway actually can resist the high-fat child, okay, as, as opposed to control mice that fed on a very high-fat child um, that resembled the, the Burger King double whopper. So up until now, we told you that we designed many different pathways. I don't want to leave you with an impression that you just put a lot of pathways together, it just automatically work. Actually, it's quite challenging. And this, is, this uh, figure illustrates the theoretical challenge of that. It turns out that all these complicated pathways operate in a stable region. And depending on how close it is to unstable region, you may get a, a problem. In addition, inside the cell, the enzyme concentration fluctuates. And so as enzyme concentration fluctuates, you may move from a stable region into an unstable region, and that causes a problem. So this is a, one of the fundamental reasons why this metabolic pathway um, engineering is challenging. So at the end, I'd like to get back to the major the message I want to um, uh, deliver. That is, these metabolic pathways are developed, are evolved, to, to help cells to grow, not to solve human problems. And if we want to solve human problems, we should develop our own pathways. Fortunately, the metabolic networks are plastic. However, in order to design these pathways, you need to consider robustness. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge many, many people that come to my lab. Um, some of the uh, former students, uh, former postdocs, and the current student and current postdoc, the uh, uh, fantastic workers uh, that make all these uh, uh, work uh, possible. And I thank the uh, funding sources. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to move to the next speaker. Okay. Thank you.